Hey, y'all. We did salvage this pottery some time ago. We haven't really turned it in, but I guess we should give it to the man with the awful hair, who was a complete jerk to us, because why not? We must proceed in a forward direction towards the completion of all quests. Yeah. Let, let, let's not. <laughs> let's not. So yes, we are now underway with a major portion of the salvage quests. But there's another portion to it. Let's talk to John Eric. <laughs> I need you to find me something. The ultimate vinegar! Ah. The most amazing vinegar ever conceived. I'm sure we'll find our ways over there again to dig up some ultimate vinegar. First, though, we're gonna go look at our journal. Because I do believe there is a number of small salvage slash random quests slash rumors to investigate. Well, we can talk to GG for some more salvage quests. Yes, got that one. Did this one? Let's see. I identified fishermen seen in the Cordica River midstream. Hmm. We'll have to investigate that one later. And apparently there's something going on at the aquarium. Hmm, that's another thing we'll have to investigate. But first, let's take a look at the treasure rumors. Something hidden in the Volk Castle. It's also a couple. Actually, a couple of these quests are specific to the Gautama Atoll, so we should probably best get them. Abnormal selenium levels near the Mac Micro Atolls, and some treasure near Dolphin Island. Well, I suppose this is a good time to go investigate that and see what we can find. Okay, so first off, let's focus on the reef, and just a bit of a spoiler, today's dive isn't going to be super mega relevant. We're taking care of these minor quests, taking care of business, doing a few rumors, working on the map, it's not really going to be much else. I'd not include it all, but it's a good chance to talk about stuff I think is interesting for a bit, and I'm sure you're well aware at this point that I will seize any and all opportunities to share things I find interesting or enjoyable. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to wax lyrical about something near and dear to my heart. The Chordates. Uh -huh. So, Chordata is the phylum of the animal kingdom defined by those deuterostome animals, animals that develop their anus prior to the mouth, sorry to say, that at an embryonic level possess a notochord, the flexible rod-like structure that serves as the early predecessor to our backbones. A dorsal nerve cord, much like our eventual spinal nerve cord. Pharyngeal slits, a feature still extant in tunicates that we only have transiently during embryonic development. It's kind of a filter feeding organ. An endostyle, a groove on the pharynx that produces mucus for transporting food to the esophagus. Another one we don't really have a functional one even as an embryo. And a postanal tail which, again, I only really have on the embryonic stage, but, you know, rip, our tail, thanks a lot of evolution, I guess. And these are the core traits that 
we, being chordates, have that separate us from non-chordate deuterostomes like sea cucumbers, starfish, and the like. There are three subphylums within chordata as well. We have the uh, tunicata, which is the tunicates, salps, sea squirts, and the like, which are very w weird. Uh, the kind of jelly... not really jellyfish, right, but they're they're, they're just weird. Imagine weird things that also have notochords. <laughs> that, that, that is the tunicates. Uh, you have the cephalochordata, which are the lancelets, which you can kind of view them as being like fish stuck eternally in the larval stage. They have... They have uh, their notochords their entire time, but they don't really have skulls or, you know, spines or any really complex structures. They're very... They have all the basic building blocks of what we define of, you know, the chordates in terms of everything else, but they don't have any of the things that separate them from us, the vertebrates, vertebrata, or craniata, depending on who you talk to, which includes the hagfish, the lampreys, and of course fish and all things de descended from fish. Amphibians, reptiles, reptiles, synapsids, rip birds, mammals, so on and so forth. And now we push to rock. <laughs> Thing us and Mandelbrot are able to accomplish because we are super strong chordates. Chordate pride! So why did I talk about chordates? I don't know. Felt like it. Felt like talking about taxonomy. Taxonomy is weird and interesting and complicated. And it's weird to think about all the weird, you know, differences between us and our families, you know, our relatives. We're so closely related, yet yeah, so different. How strange. That's such a strange thing evolution is. There's so much that's different from us, between us and, say, the tunicates, yet yeah, we're so closely related. Strange. Gemini, the twins, is one of the constellations of the Zodiac. It represents the twins, Castor and Pollux, the Dioscuri. Pollux was the son of Zeus, while Castor was the son of Tyndarius, the king of Sparta. When Castor died due to being mortal, Pollux begged his father to give him immortality, which he did by chucking both of them into the sky. Even when you consider our differences from, you know, our close relative like the Lancelets or the Tunicates, and it... At the embryonic level, there's still a ton similar between us and them. I mean, obviously we develop structures that are very different and we become quite divergent from them. But one of the interesting things is that on an embryonic level, you can kind of trace the evolutionary history of it. It's why the characteristics that are used for defining what's a chordate is ultimately, it's not the adult features that we possess, though we do share developments of such, at an embryonic level, we exhibit the basal sort of mechanisms that define our group. So, you know, an embryonic, very early embryonic developed, you know, human child has a lot familiar with, say, a tunicat, or especially, or even more, more especially, things like fish or frogs or birds. At that early level, we're basically indistinguishable from any other animal, especially mammal to mammal. So yeah, I basically just rambled about taxonomy for a bit here. For no real particular reason other than, you know, felt like it. I find taxonomy interesting, and you have to deal with it. Or, you have dealt with it. Whatever. Anyways. Salvage. Nancy. Praise my shit. model. Hey, the hand mill. So, the hand mill is <laughs> one of those things where in the uh, English version, for some reason, they kind of messed a little bit with the name. So you may recall, remember from the uh, rumor description for that treasure that we were looking for a especially salty area. And what sort of thing could a hand mill be that generates salt, a ton of salt, and be quote-unquote Legendary. What is it? It's 
the Sampo. Some of you may recall from a rather amusing <laughs> MST3K where they're very confused what a Sampo is. Uh, the Sampo is a thing from Finch mythology. It's a sort of magical hand mill that can pr bring good fortune for its owner and generate sort of just resources. It's, it's an incredible artifact of magical powers that can do wonderful things. Like generate infinite salt. Infinite salt! You know, and salt is a precious resource that was worth, you know, as much as, or, you know, comparable to at least gold, a degree. But I, I don't know why they kind of obfuscated that in the uh, English version. Maybe they didn't think people would get the reference. Eh. Totally a sampo, though. Totally a sampo. Sort of equivalent to the whole cornucopia of uh, Greek mythology and whatnot. It's the same sort of concept, you know. The cornucopia of salt. <laughs> Salty cornucopia. I will find you someday, mysterious object. Yes, I swear. But anyways, folks, I think that is it for this update. See you next time when we go up to the Arctic again to, you know, do a little something. Salps are chordates like us and fish and everything else. They're tunicates, which basically means they're weird as fuck chordates that filter feed using water-filled sacklite structures called siphons. You know. They look like jellyfish and siphonophores, but since they're chordates, they're not really that closely related to them other than perhaps having some shared ancestry, much like us. Salps are found pretty much throughout the world in a variety of waters and temperature conditions, though they're most abundant in the cold waters near the Antarctic, forming enormous swarms in the deep ocean and competing with krill and whatnot. Salps have a complicated life cycle, alternating between colonial aggregates and solitary generations. Basically, the colonial generations bud from the solitary individuals, and these aggregates being hermaphroditic chains that mate with other chains, and then eventually produce new asexual solitary stages that, after roaming and eating, eventually bud off more cloned colonial generations. So, it's complicated. Salps exhibit one of the fastest growth rates among multicellular organisms, having no larval stage and being basically ready to reproduce very shortly after birth. This is essentially their main survival mechanism. They outrace predators numerically speaking. When there's a lot of food presence, say in a phytoplankton bloom, the salps bud off at incredible rates and generate tons and tons and tons of new salps, very quickly stripping the phytoplankton from the area. Sometimes to the point that the salps clog themselves to death and just crush themselves down onto the seafloor. Salps. 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 Salps.
ourselves. Salps.